first slide. Today, instead of a formal reading, I'm going to introduce you to Viola Liuzzo. Next. So she was a courageous Unitarian Universalist hero. She was a mom of five children. Next. She was deeply in love with her husband there on the left. And on the right, I love this picture because it shows her brushing one of her daughter's hair. And I think so often with heroes, we forget that they were just regular people doing what they were called to do. Next. These are her five children. Um, she was a very hands-on parent. She lived in Detroit most of her life. And the reason I became so interested in her is that I remembered watching a civil rights movie when I was a child. And I remember my mom getting really upset at one part of it. My mom um, was friends with her oldest daughter and um, they were neighbors and my grandma and um, Viola or Vi would um, line up in the carpool pickup lane, you know, for picking their kids up from school. So they were neighbors. I never thought much about her for years. Next. Now, Vi had um, a lot of children, but she also had a baby that died shortly after it was born, um, and it had been baptized and it had a Catholic funeral. But later she had a stillborn baby and the Catholic Church would not bury it um, because it hadn't been baptized. And that caused her so much stress between losing the child before and then this, that it really sent her um, into a deep quest about her faith. And I think a lot of us can relate to that, that something terrible happened and we needed to reassess life. And, um, she really believed in an all loving God. And so she couldn't believe that her church maybe didn't. Um, and that's how she perceived it. And so she went looking for a new faith and she became a Unitarian, Unitarian Universalist. So um, this is first UU of Detroit at the time that she went there. They had several um, buildings and they are still in this, um, this building. So if you ever go to Detroit, you can go there. And her first minister um, was Reverend Dr. Tracy Pullman, who is a, um, a man I went and looked up and he had quite a good reputation. If you could click. So um, at her church, many of the members had been freedom riders in the bus boycotts. And so she started to hear about justice. And I think this is so important for us in a interim year, um, interim time that we are in with ministry, because we often say, well, we need more members and we need more money. And of course we do. We want to have our dreams fulfilled. But people don't join because of us having that need. They join because of what we offer to the world and we give because of the difference that we make. And so she joined this church where things were happening where it was exciting, where, where people were committed, where there was deep com community. Um, she also, um, not quite there yet, but that's okay. Um, she um, joined the NAACP, which was very unusual for a white housewife back then. Um, she protested all kinds of things her whole life in small ways when she saw injustices on the, her jobs or in school or in her neighborhood. And one of the things she protested um, was some education laws that were passed um, in Detroit that would make it really easy for people to quit school. And she was very dedicated to education and she even was arrested um, over that. Her best friend was a black woman. I feel funny even saying this because it sounds weird in today's age to name the color, but it was so unusual in the 60s for that to be really public. They even traveled together to an event sponsored by the UU Church in New York, right? So she was influenced by MLK. Um, she was very aware of how shook the nation was by Reverend James Reeb's death a few weeks earlier in this famous March time. 
You'll learn a lot more about him next week and even more if you take our new class that um, Mary and I are offering that you should register for because it's going to be a podcast. You don't have to read anything, only listen. <laughs> right? And then we'll have a discussion. It's going to be great. I, you'll find, um, as you get to know me, I use all kinds of media um, and, and ways of forming um, my knowledge base, not just books. Um, so you'll learn more about James Reeve next week. Now, she was seeing these pictures coming out of Selma, and her and her kids were watching it, and her husband were watching it on the news. And when we think of the Selma March, I know I always thought of it as like a day, but they were working at this. The, there were conferences in Selma. They were, they were doing lots of work for several months. They were trying to make it happen. The first attempts to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, that's the bridge up in the top corner there, um, didn't happen. And they saw the people beating it. It, it interrupted the news hours. Um, so next slide. I took this this picture in August, um, the Transitions Department had all of us in interim ministry meet in Alabama this year to be at the seat of change because change is what interim times are, are about. So we met there. Um, you'll notice Selma looks about the same as it did in the 1960s. It was like going into a time warp. And I'll comment on why that is later on this week and next week. Next. So she decides to go to Selma, and one thing you really learn when you study civil rights is how important churches are for building community and being at the seat of rights. We can operate in a place that is between many. So it's not the nonprofit, it's not the school, it's not the government. We are another place, and that's why church and the notion of church is so important. So this here is Brown African Methodist Episcopal Church, or Brown AME. Um, and that was the center of civil rights activity in Selma during their work. And I took this picture, so the scaffolding's current. They're trying to get money to um, renovate it because it's such an important uh, place in our nation's history. Um, and you'll hear a lot about it. But it's interesting to me, too, that all of the projects surround this church. We're talking like 10 feet away, not a mile away, not 10 miles, like, like right around that. And so as you go there, if we ever travel or you'd ever travel on one of the, um, the freedom um, tours that um, you use have designed, you'll get to see just how history was laid out. Next. So you can see that um, they're really working on restoring it and I'll show you more pictures of it next week. Next. Now, sometimes when we hear about historical figures, we think they're somehow really special. I'd never do that. This was an ordinary mom. Um, she didn't have lots of money. She didn't have lots of time. She had five kids for, you know. Um, she started taking medical classes at Wayne State University in Detroit. She thought that she could help this part of the movement by providing first aid or using her car as maybe an ambulance or, um, you got to remember too that not everyone had cars, especially in the black community. So bringing a car was a major resource. Um, so she was just helping as she was with what she had. Next. Brown AME is situated amongst these projects and this is one of them and this is um, her daughter with the woman that she stayed with Mrs. Jackson. And Mrs. Jackson, along with another um, civil rights worker, Alice West, who is a member of the school system, they, um, they were just letting people sleep on their floors and their couches. You know, they were, again, doing what they had to do with what they had. And um, they described Mrs. Liuzzo, or Bai, um, with high regard. Oh, I couldn't believe a white person was down here doing everything she could to help black people as if she was black herself. Now, for those of you who've taken, um, taken a lot of um, education or reading or seminars or things like that, we learned that it's really important to, um, to go into communities when we're going into them and learning from those around us, that we don't come in with our own agenda, we follow. 
right? Next. Now, Vi identified with black people in the South and often referred to fighting for black equity as my people. And she really felt that pain. She was not indifferent to the suffering. On her first day of work in Selma, she met a 19 year old young man named Leroy Mutton. And he was the transportation coordinator and he was a worker for the movement. And his job was to shuffle workers around the city in rented or borrowed vehicles. And she just handed him her keys and he promised he would take good care of it. So next, now they started with about 8,000 marching by the time they tried the third time. And by the time it was underway, they had more than 25,000 people marching. And she was um, helping elders that maybe couldn't walk the whole way, giving them rides. She was walking. Um, and we often see in the next slide, when she was walking, she often had no shoes on. She hated shoes. She was she grew up in the in the south. She was very attuned to nature. She loved being in nature. Today we'd probably call her a forest bather, right? Um, but she also was a proper 1960s woman. And so she dressed like a lady of the time. But gosh, those shoes were uncomfortable and they did not suit her. So she took them off and you'll hear more about that later. Next. On the fourth day of the march, she had been assigned working, nursing work at St. Jude's Medical Complex in Montgomery. And you'll learn more about these medical complexes because it does not equal hospital like we think. You'll learn more next week about that. Um, and there were rumored plots that MLK would be shot that day or other prominent civil rights leaders would be killed. But being the free spirit that she was, she walked to the capital of Alabama barefoot four miles um, from, the, from the medical complex. And she witnessed those speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And after the entire march was over, she had a car full of people. She was driving elders back from Montgomery to Selma. It's about a 50, 60 mile drive. And it is through deep forest. There, even today, there, there's like nothing between one city and the next if you haven't been there. And on the second trip is when the Ku Klux Klan murdered her. Next. So her violent death did help her, um, did help the Voting Rights Act happen. There are lots of murals that often feature her. Um, we'll think about, um, we'll think about those pictures of President Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act people were enraged that she was killed too. And by that point, James Reeve had been killed. Another activist had been killed. Um, and, and so that really spurred people on to go, this is ridiculous, you know? And the Ku Klux Klan thought that if they murdered her, that would end, that would end all these protests and we could get back on with, you know, things as they were. Um, she is the only white woman honored at the Civil Rights Martyrs Memorial. And um, there's a beautiful statue of her in Detroit now. It's been up, put up more recently in uh, Viola Luzio Park in Detroit. And in that, she is also barefoot. In August, when I was at the Martyrs Memorial for the Civil Rights Movement, I snapped a photo of Viola Luzio and um, texted it to my mom. And I said, you knew her, right? And she replied, yes, I was friends with, with her daughter and I still can't believe she would leave her five children. And I was so struck by my mom's response 57 years later. I'm like, wow, mom, you're blaming the victim for getting killed and leaving her children without a mother? This didn't even sound like my mom. I was like, wow, I wonder why. I now know why. There are so many things we could focus on about her. Her growing up poor, her sense of justice from a young age, her long commitment to equality and equity, way before it was common or in vogue, or how she was trying to move beyond being just a housewife 
I could focus on how the FBI created a horrific smear campaign against her because she was a woman and because her husband was a teamster or because her husband was friends with Jimmy Hoffa. In fact, the lines my mom said to me in August, she never should have left those children without a mother, were word for word how the federal smear campaign painted Viola Leozo. And as I learned more about Vi, as they called her, I was struck by how she never let her own limitations keep her from sharing her gifts and resources and using them to better everyone. Ain't gonna let no one turn me round. I think we can all be inspired by her courage to do what she could do with what she had. Home for Viola was in Detroit, Michigan, and she was born a poor white person. She faced an unfortunate childhood like some of us have, and she faced insecurities like poverty. Her father was a coal miner, and her mother was a grocery store manager. They often lived in one bedroom shacks. They moved from state to state, trying to find work. And for a period of time, she even lived in the segregated South. And due to living in the South and being poor, Leozo recognized the hardships and hate that black people living in the South endured and recognized them as worse than what she was experiencing. She had this charming characteristic of compassion for all kinds of life. And she made this evident when, as a teen, she once stole money out of the cash register at the grocery store that her mother worked at, not for her or something frivolous like a toy, but for a black child that she felt was in desperate need of help. And as hard of a time as her family had, she could see that black people continued to have a much harder time. And she asked herself why some people had so much wealth and others had so little. She wondered what the color of a person's skin had to do with whether they would be a hard worker or a good student. She really thought things would be better when they moved to Michigan and she encountered segregation there like she had never seen before. She saw how white people and black people lived in two separate worlds and she wondered why people thought they couldn't be friends. And all that thinking helped shape her opinions about what is right and wrong and fair. But once she would make her mind up, nobody was going to turn her around. Whether it was the people Vi worked with, the people in her neighborhood, or the atrocities she saw in her Detroit neighborhood, she saw these fights as everyone's concern. She couldn't comprehend why she was often alone working on things of justice or the only one speaking up. She led her children in those education protests in Detroit. And one of her children says, if mom saw wrong, she took action. When a neighbor's house burned down on Christmas Eve one year, she pounded on the toy store owner's home, insisting he open up his shop so that she could buy presents for the family. In one job I had, a black secretary was laid off without any severance pay that the rest of them were used to getting. And she turned her over, own check over to the woman and tried to organize others to chip in. She was fired for drawing public attention to these inequities. She rebelled against injustices in other institutions as well. She was arrested for protesting the Detroit Board of Education policies. And in all of her early protests, she felt she was solitary. She was lonely. She couldn't figure out why no one else cared. When one of her daughters was asked, who was she? She was like everything you'd want in a mom and a hero to be, not as a martyr, but as a wonderful human being who loved every living creature. The intolerance for suffering that had led Luizo to enroll in nursing classes at Wayne State University, that made her even more acutely aware of Black Americans' feelings of invisibility. During a visit to a department store and seeing like elaborate Christmas displays, probably at JL Hudson on Woodward Avenue, she asked her daughter Penny then at age 13, how she'd feel if every Santa she saw 
was black instead of white. When Penny was 16, Vi asked her how she'd feel if the magazines she loved never put pretty white girls on their covers. The questions offered a glimpse into a world totally different than the one I was living in, Penny said. Not only did she have the five children, but she had those babies that she lost, and that's what sent her on that path to look for a new faith. If her love, Vi said, was too deep to discriminate against a baby, she figured God's had to be immeasurably deeper, and that's why she left Catholicism. She found quite a home in universalism with an all-loving God. And that sent her looking at many spiritual paths, her children say, that she didn't just go right from Catholicism to Unitarian Universalism, but she really loved us preaching that all-loving God. Ain't nobody gonna let me turn no around. Mm -hmm. In 1963, Vi began studying philosophy and sociology and political science, and there she started to be surrounded by debates about civil rights. And she was a soon attending weekly talks held by the school chaplain, a Christian existentialist named Reverend Malcolm Boyd. Malcolm had been a freedom writer who believed in the ethics of action. And he was derided by conservatives as that beatnik priest who held religious discussions in taverns. Malcolm responded to such critics by saying the church needed to go out to the people where they are and speak their language. We move on to 1964 when Vi's best friend, Sarah Evans, who was black, urged her to join the NAACP. And that's when they took that trip to upstate New York to go to a civil rights seminar sponsored by the United Nations. I think another interesting thing about that is the Detroit Unitarian Universalist Church sponsored it too. And so that's why they went. And sometimes it's not that the church has to do the thing, they have to endorse the thing in order to be a part of something. And I offer that to you because so often people say, it's so much work. There are so many ways to do this work. So, that church was a hotbed of activism, and many of the congregants, like I told you, had been freedom riders. And discussions about Selma were swirling, especially on March 7th, Bloody Sunday, when the marchers were attacked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The whole family was watching those, those attacks on their TV. They were talking about it. She had teens. They knew what was happening. Her youngest child was six at the time. And on March 11th is when UU minister James Reeb was beaten to death in Selma. And the church in Detroit, like many UU churches, held emotional memorials. By then, Phi felt that she needed to respond to the call and journey to Selma herself. You can imagine as a Southern woman who had grown up Southern, she felt this kinship. She was living and being made aware. And I often say, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So she, she was really horrified by this violence. And her husband said, you could get killed. And she went anyway. She, he said, this is not your fight. And she said, this is everyone's fight. And so she drove her Oldsmobile, her station wagon to Selma, took her a few days to get there by herself. She kissed all her children goodbye, and she began to drive south. She didn't have lots of money. She didn't have any fame. She didn't have a lot of time. She asked her friend to watch her children for her. What did she have? She had gumption. She had wild courage. She let the movement use her car. As soon as she got there, she started cooking food because we so often forget that it's not just about marching, right? We have to feed all these people. She ran errands. She offered her nursing skills for first aid and she helped the elderly. And when I heard this, I thought, well, of course she did. 
So often we focus on Martin Luther King, but we often forget that someone made dinner for him. We forget that someone did his laundry. We forget that movements are made with thousands of people doing what they could with what they have. Someone had to feed the marchers. Someone had to treat those sprained ankles and bandage the blisters. Somebody fetched water. And yet this was a really different time. It was far more unusual for a white woman to be doing this work alongside mostly black people. In fact, many of the marchers who are still alive were astonished that she took up the cause as though it was her own. Another thing that was very unusual and dangerous was black and white people riding together in a car, especially men and women. After the march, they completed the march. They were in Montgomery. She walked her four miles barefoot from the clinic to go and listen to Martin Luther King. And I want to share with you a few words from that speech that she would have heard. Last Sunday, more than 8,000 of us started on a mighty walk from Selma, Alabama. They told us we couldn't get there. There were those who said we would only get there over their dead bodies. But all the world knows that we are here and we are standing before the forces of power in the state of Alabama saying, we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Today, I wanna tell the city of Selma, today, I wanna say to the state of Alabama, today, I wanna say to the people of America and the nations of the world that we are not about to turn around. We are on the move now. Yes, we are on the move and no way of racism can stop us. Burning our churches will not deter us. The bombing of our homes will not dissuade us. The beating and killing of our clergymen and young people will not divert us. Now imagine this housewife, imagine this mom listening to a reference to the murdered clergyman that was a UU minister, Reverend James Reed, and knowing that she was another Unitarian Universalist who had made the journey he intended to. She had helped that movement. What pride she must have felt. She called her children and her husband, telling them jubilantly how the march had gone. It was great. Everyone's celebrating. Her daughter said, Mom, I learned how to write cursive. And she was like so excited. She's like, leave it on my dresser. I want to I want to look at it as soon as I get home. After they hung up the phone, her sons began playing protester, and even her husband told them to stop it. It was still dangerous. He made them stop joking. We know he was afraid. Maybe he had a feeling about what was about to happen. Later that night, after the march was finished, Viola was helping the marchers get home, and she and Leroy Mutton, that black civil rights worker I told you about, they drove along Highway 80, and a car full of white supremacist men from the Ku Klux Klan began following them. 25 miles. Imagine being chased and tailed. She became so frustrated and so scared that she started singing the freedom songs at the top of her lungs. 20 miles later, those men were still on her tail, and it was a lonely stretch of road and they pulled up next to her car and they shot her 14 times. And they killed her because she was a white woman trying to help black people claim their rights, walking up to the freedom land. By midnight, she would be dead, shot while driving, a black man home from the demonstration. And the next morning, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover called President Johnson with the news. The Bureau was poised to arrest Liuzzo's killers. Three men, three members of the Ku Klux Klan, but as it turned out, there had been a fourth man in the car, an FBI informant. And yet, that informant was known for being very racist. And on the call, Hoover told Johnson what the agents learned from the informant and how exactly the FBI infiltrated the Klan. Sounds good, right? 
Well, due to the misogynistic stereotypes of the time, it was easy for J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, and the United States government to not solve the crime and bring justice. Instead, he discredited Luyuzo. He made her the target of sexism and slander. And if you watch the movie or read the book or come to tea with Reverend D after this, we can talk more about that. But her wrongful death has led to many unanswered and disturbing questions about the government and the lengths they will go to to protect themselves, their agenda, and their mistakes. The KKK really thought this would be it. They already got rid of that one minister, now we'll kill a housewife, and that will stop the civil rights movement. They bragged about it, they put it on their magazine covers, they made sure her family saw all the pictures. Well, that, that act got people to call their legislators and put more and more pressure on to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the very one that is being dismantled today. Viola's dedication to her values and sacrifice helped all people get a little closer to freedom land. And as the civil rights movement has been an inspiration for oppressed people all over the world, we have her to thank, even though her reputation has been tragically harmed. It has harmed her children and like racism does, it harms everyone. And that is why Selma is still sitting just the way it was in the 60s. Racism kills so many and hurts so many.